What's going on? And I was like, oh. put my hand down. And Doreen was, had been looking at me for a while. And she just went like this, so I had to stand up. Right here? All right, right here? All right there? Oh, okay, that's a little bit better. So anyway, I stood up and I figured, okay, I'm just going to tell my, my story and then I'm going to sit back down. Lo and behold, when I stood up and I told my story, everybody really, really went nuts. I mean, up on the balconies at Roy Thompson Hall and, and it was just, it was really, really crazy. And then I thought, wow, like, what's going on? So then the rest of that day, it was, it was just crazy. I mean, there was a good 3,100 people there and people at the show were treating me exactly like the authors that were there from Ahab. So it was, it was quite crazy. People coming up just wanting to touch you, wanting to give you a hug. And it was, it was very, very special. And this is, that is exactly what the book's about. This is exactly what my Dead Guy Talking Talks are going to be about. Um, Hopefully, we're going to work down into some webinars and stuff. Right now, what I want to do is I want to back up just a little tiny bit uh, and tell you guys a little, a little bit about that special inescapable day that we each face. Mine, specifically, as Stephanie had mentioned, took place on February the 26th, 2010, at 9.25 in the morning while I was on a city bus during the only snowstorm of the year I had the heart attack and it was something that was very out of order yeah along with it there's a specific kind of peacefulness that goes along with it I mean and, and a dump truck load of, of pain like you wouldn't believe Hey, people talk about a, a horse standing on your chest. Well, this is like a dump truck filled with elephants. And the snowstorm, I had to walk six blocks through knee-deep snow and blinding snow, blowing wind to get to a bus stop. And it was kind of funny, by the time I had actually made it there, it didn't actually... Not, it wasn't too bad. And I stood there and thought, okay, I'm going to be okay. Yet the back of your mind is going, you ding dong, you need to get to the hospital. But we turn around and we all go, it's not me, it's, nothing's wrong, it's not today, I don't need to do this, I just need to continue on with my routine. And that's what we all do when we start shutting down that other side of us, that other half of us, that is telling us the right things to do. And we have to learn to start and listen to that more. Um, you go through a phase where you want to ask for help, but you don't want to inconvenience anybody. You really don't. And I've heard it from many, many, many people I've talked to and, and worked with that have had similar experience. They just, they don't want to inconvenience anybody else with their major problem. And it wasn't until I turned around and I decided and I made a choice to turn around and ask for help. That was the first choice I made. And as I had actually asked the bus driver to call 911, and she did, she picked up the phone, she looked at me in the mirror because I was sitting kind of behind her. She just only asked why. Why do you need me to call 911? And I said, I'm having a heart attack. I was sitting in the seat, the face is in the aisle, my hands on the edge, and I had just kind of relaxed back, and I was looking at my feet out in front of me, and then I died. And everything just kind of closes in, and I zip. You're still in a, this is where you transfer from one type of physical reality consciousness into another one. You're still kind of conscious aware, but not of the physical. You just slide in. And you really don't know that it's happening. Except for the fact that dump truck of pain is now gone. And there is such a peacefulness to it that 
is I have spent the last four years trying to, in written word, trying to describe it, and it just doesn't doesn't even come close, really and honestly. Um, at the time, I I did. I, I felt the sensation where I just kind of slid out of my body a little bit, and I almost slid off the stage. Uh, I looked down and I noticed that there was like four legs, and I had my hands out, and I'm like, okay, all right, I must be there. And then all of a sudden, my guardian, a tiger, got six foot tall at the shoulder, and actually, uh, let's see if we can, I know it's a little dark, it's a little dark, the tiger is back there in the back. comes walking up to me and I, I had seen him twice in my lifetime before. Two very, very difficult periods in my lifetime during my late 20s and into my mid-30s. So I knew him, but it was it was kind of odd, you know, it's a blizzard outside and there's this tiger strolling onto the bus. And he's just as physical any of the chairs, anybody, any anything. So I'm like, you know, like, what are you doing here? So he just comes walking up to me and he nuzzles his head into my face, my shoulder, and he's got like a great big huge head. And he pulls away and he looks at me, and just thought to thought, he goes, you're about to die. And I'm thinking like, yeah, yeah, no kidding, no kidding. But this is okay, this is okay. So he turned and he faced to the windows on the other side of the bus, which I can now see because it, things had opened up just a little teeny weeny bit and everything was like a, a shower. You see a shower stall, it's all steamed up, and then you, you clear off a spot in there. That's what I could see. And the misty milky part, you just, you can't. So he started rolling a whole bunch of pictures in the windows on the other side of the bus, but it was just a small spot. It was past, present, future. And then it came up, and I was already making a choice. I was already making a decision. He didn't. He didn't say anything, and then the rolling pictures, the holograms, kind of stopped on two bus pictures of my daughters, my two daughters, and that was what kind of put me over to really make the choice to come back, and it wasn't a case of where they were putting guilt or anything on me, because as we'll, hopefully I'll have enough time to talk about uh, there's only one emotion on the other side, and that's it. There isn't uh, the roller coaster ride. So anyway, I had, with everything that I am, I made the choice. I made the choice, and I said, I want to stay. <laughs> but then I thought, oops, I just said the wrong thing, meaning I wanted to stay there. So real quickly, I said, no, 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 no I, I want to live, I want to live. Tiger looked back to me, and he said, that's your choice. And I said, yes. And he said, now you have a task. So Tiger got, just kind of turned around, and then I got this idea, and I felt I was to follow. So we all get up out of our chairs, or wherever we're in a sitting position, to go somewhere, and there's a physical action to it. But as soon as you think it, you just, like, you go. And you really, and I got a real strong sensation that we travel a good distance. When in actuality, because now what I want to do is I want to try and explain the difference <clears throat> and where the other side actually is. If you take a glass cube container and you fill that glass cube container with smoke, the glass cube container is the physical world in which we live and the smoke is the other side. Everything, and I know we've read from here and there, time, space, uh, and everything coexists in, in one location, and that's true. Um, so anyway, when I went with Tiger, we ended up, Tiger had just kind of arrived, well, I guess it was like the same time, but he had almost like taking a couple steps, but of course he really wasn't stepping, it's just the way I perceived it. And he had turned himself to me on a bit of an angle, 
and I was paying attention to him, and I, and I had stopped a, a fair distance away from him. Then, these, while I'm facing this way here, these three beings came in right at the peripheral over here. So I went like this. And then they were gone. So I went back to Tiger. And then I seen him again. And I went like this. And of course, I'm getting a little confused. Like, every time I look that way, why did they disappear? But then I realized I was an amateur, and I'm a bit of an amateur astronomer. And of course, we all, once in a while, we look up at the sky and see a very, very, very faint star. But as soon as you actually look right at it, it disappears. And that's the same concept. That's the same idea. You look a little bit away, and it's there. You look back, and it comes back. Um, so anyway, I went. Uh, Tiger was standing there. And Tiger had actually said, because of my confusion with, with the three beams there, which it is now, and this is unfortunately, and I really apologize, these are a couple of dark stars. This is a picture that I took here in Guelph at the Covered Bridge, or not here, sorry, in Guelph at the Covered Bridge. And I was walking through uh, the bridge, and I could feel and I could sense the three of them there. You can see the two little white lights, the two little white dots. Now, the more important thing, I think maybe. Hopefully this one. Oh. I don't know whether you can see. Right below the two white lights is a purple orb. And that purple orb was the center beam of the three that I was with on the other side. The two white lights that you see are the two students of the teacher. They are students and they will end up becoming like the teacher. Doing the same job of guiding people, guiding other beings to help them come along as well. I don't have a whole lot of time, a whole lot of time. <laughs> I see people walking up here. So I'm gonna try and just cover a few things. What took place there, once I'd taken the task, is I'd spent roughly a day's worth of happenings, or time if you will. Time doesn't really exist. And like I said, I just don't have the time, time to get into too, too much. So, um, uh, doesn't exist and so it's more of a happening it's more of what you do in a day that fills up that that space so they had showed me just a continual revolving holographic thing that showed past present future and the true essence of what we're actually supposed to be here for and I, and I see that oh, have I got a fair amount of time okay I'm doing okay yeah, you're sitting behind me. I'm not going to say this. Um, so, it's important that we start and really, really pay attention to what is going on. Uh, the human race is in a lot of trouble. Uh, a lot, a lot of trouble. We have to start and actually understand more what we are. And once you understand what you are, then you will know instantly who you are. Because we spend our whole life searching and searching and searching for who we are, never really truly and honestly knowing. So, and it's just, you know, we've been taught and trained and taught and taught and taught through everything that we do, through our education systems and everything, to put us on one thing. And that's because we, you know, we're from a, a physical world, and that's the way we've been taught trained. What we have to understand is that the physical world and everything that we do within our lives is made up of the non-physical. It is comprised of nothing. Nothing. <laughs> um, the importance of what's going on now uh, is evident in the rash of, there's an awful lot of books that I wrote. Um, you know, I've gone through, since it, since my experience took place, I've gone through a lot of different things, time alone, time with people, and the more that I see uh, and, and spend time with people, talking to them and that, I find the importance, and that really, really inspires me, really energizes me to, to continue forward with 
of what I'm trying to do. And that's to help out. You know, we've got books out like Proof of Heaven by Dr. Ethan Alexander. Um, I'm not too familiar with... One of the things I did do is I tried to stay away from a lot of the, the books just until I got my own finished. Um, yeah, Proof of Heaven by Dr. Ivan Alexander. And what do we got? We got The Life, or The Afterlife of Billy Fingers by Ann uh, Kogan. Uh, to Heaven and Back by Dr. Mary Neal. Uh, what else we got? Uh, Colton. Burpose uh, story, which was written by his father, uh, Heaven is for Real. And what else we got here? And also Dying to Be Me by Anita Moriani, who was at our, at the I Can Do a Conference by Hay House. Uh, she was a fantastic person. She really, truly, and honestly is. And her story is uh, very amazing and inspiring. And we're getting there. We're getting there. Are we, are we there? We are there? Okay. I just got one little joke I'm going to toss in here real quick. <laughs> um, the thing that, I, that I, I find very, very funny is the fact that it's called a, an NDE, or a near-death experience, because there's nothing near about it. Not a thing. That's like going to the Bahamas or the Caribbean, and you have to call it a near trip just because you had to come back. Just because you had to come back. My own near-death experience, it was like, you know, I died, and I actually did go there. People say, no, you didn't. I said, well, yeah, I did. It was, you know, I went over. I was like, oh, hello. Oh. Anybody home? Anybody in? No, no, okay. You right? <laughs> um, yeah, you know what? I, I see you're busy, and I'll be back later. I'll be back later. <laughs> uh, we'll be seeing you. Yeah. Anyway, I want you to understand that each and every one of us is an individual cell of the human race. And I know that to be true, and you guys are the cell of the heart. So I want to thank you. Okay, I'll turn this back over to stuff. Thanks, Alan. Anyone, uh, if you'd like to meet Alan, uh, he'd be right here beside the stage. Talk to him, he can share his experiences with you. Uh, it's incredible. It uh, doesn't warrant just a 20 minute talk on stage. So make the time to go and see Alan. Uh, next coming up, we have Global 